At this point, we're going to move on into um, osteoporosis, and then we'll do arthritis. Yeah, with that, let's be wild and crazy. Let's do arthritis first, <laughs> then we'll do osteoporosis. So arthritis is inflammation or pain of the joints. So one important thing we have to remember is that when a person has inflammation of a joint, it could be an infectious process. And there's or another disease. So there's many diseases that are autoimmune that have inflammation of the joint as part of them. So for example, systemic lupus erythematosus has polyarthritis as one of the symptoms. What do we mean by poly? Multiple joints. So, but for the most part, what we're talking about right now is gonna be three particular types of arthritis. So the very first one we're gonna talk about is osteoarthritis. So when you have two joints that meet, or two bones that meet with a joint, what's in between them? Cartilage. So the cartilage is actually kind of lining each bone. And the cartilage um, acts as a little bit of a shock absorber and also kind of like a smoother. So it makes the joint movement smooth. When you have a degeneration of the cartilage, you eventually end up with osteoarthritis. Now osteoarthritis is most likely to occur in large joints that have a lot of impact, such as knees and hips. Um, it could also happen in smaller joints like fingers and in your back as well. Osteoarthritis is despite the name, not actually associated with inflammation. So even though it says itis, there's very little inflammation that occurs. So it's basically like an artificial aging that occurs in the joints. One of the interesting things that can happen with osteoarthritis is you can actually have the growth of little bone spurs. Um, so it's, no, it's not very good. Okay, so here you've got a bone. You've got another bone. Yeah, I know, those are great bones. So you can actually have the growth of little bone spurs out. It's almost, these are called osteophytes. It's almost like the joint is trying to grow together to fuse itself. And these osteophytes can be associated with pain and impaired movement. Now, here's one of the interesting things. Removing them sometimes doesn't remove the symptoms. So sometimes removing the osteophytes fixes everything. Other times it doesn't fix anything. How do you know the difference? You don't. But an extremely important thing, going back to um, what we talked about in Pathopharm 1 with pain, is that the story we tell patients has an impact on their recovery. If you tell a patient, the reason you have this pain is you've got this little osteophyte on your x-ray and you're never going to not have pain until we get rid of it, guess what you typically have doomed that patient to? They can't get relief until they have surgery. Because in their mind, there's a little bone that is causing my pain. And I won't ever get relief until that little bone is gone. Now, what does research actually tell us? that little bone might not actually be associated with their pain. And removing it might not help anything. In fact, sometimes it makes it hurt worse. How you Osteoarthritis? Yeah. Uh, it's a degenerative disease of the joints characterized by loss of cartilage. And also the growth of osteophytes. So overuse is a risk factor for developing osteoarthritis. Um, people who run too much can often destroy their hips and knee cartilage prematurely. And then being overweight is also a risk factor because you just have more pressure every time you step or stand up. As far as management of it goes, um, oh, and in the morning you typically will feel stiff but have less pain. And as you use it a little bit, you feel better. But then if you use it too much, you feel worse again. So usually you feel better in the morning and then worse throughout the day. But you, if a certain amount of exercise and movement will help 
but too much then makes it worse. As far as treatment of it goes, um, because it's a degenerative disease, it's very difficult for us to treat because we're not exactly sure what causes it in the first place. Um, cartilage is made up of, of um, hyaluronic acid. So sometimes you'll see, or glucosamine and chondroitin, you'll see those being prescribed. Now, in some dogs, phenomenal results with glucosamine and chondroitin, which are the components of cartilage. But with humans, yeah, not very good. But it's cheap and it doesn't really hurt, so what the heck, we might as well try it. I've had a couple patients, he's like, yeah, you could try it, and they come back a couple months later. That stuff saved my life. <laughs> and then, but when you actually study it in a trial, it doesn't seem to make any difference statistically at all. So, is it worth trying? Yeah. I don't know. If you believe it will work for you, it might just. Same thing as believing that you had to have surgery, prevented anything else from working, yeah, it can work. Okay, so the first thing we just said was glucosamine chondroitin. It's a supplement. Glucosamine? I know, it's not on, because it's not technically a drug, it's a supplement. And again, in humans, the results of clinical trials have been pretty terrible. But you'll occasionally find people who swear that it saved their life. And that's only treatment? No, that's just the first thing we're mentioning. Okay. So usually what you do is just manage symptoms. Um, now, the first one is you, you typically want to use the least toxic drug first, so that's going to be acetaminophen. Then moving on to NSAIDs. Eventually you could use opioids, although that's frowned on nowadays. And then the final thing would be a surgery, which can vary from just removing osteophytes to a total joint replacement. Now, when it comes to NSAIDs, there's not all NSAIDs are created equal. So what's the big thing that we learned about in Pathopharm 1 as far as NSAID classification? Say it again? Not exactly. But how do NSAIDs work? What, what do they inhibit? COX-2, and that's how they provide their anti-inflammatory effect, but they also block COX-1. So we have COX-1 slash 2 inhibitors, and then we have ones that are more selective for COX-2. So the only COX-2 inhibitor currently on the market is Celecoxib or Celebrex. Not necessarily. But then we have the non-selective ones as well. The other big thing, we didn't really talk about this very much in Pathopharm 1, is that you can also give NSAIDs topically. And topical NSAIDs actually seem to work better for osteoarthritis than systemic do. No. Right. Any questions about osteoarthritis? Okay. Next we have rheumatoid arthritis. We kind of did a little bit of this in one, right? Yes, this is pretty much just a review. So rheumatoid arthritis is actually an autoimmune disease. Body attacks itself and causes a number of problems, one of which is arthritis. Typically occurs in either late childhood or early adulthood and affects fingers and small extremities more so than large joints. Over time, leads to deformity of the joints with ulnar deviation and contra uh, contractures. 
Patients will also typically have nodules in their fingers. What are contract? How do you spell? Contract? Yeah. U-R-E. So contract chores. Contract yours. Of course it is. It just doesn't know. Okay. So because it's an, because it is a um, autoimmune disease, we want to treat it with immunosuppressants. So you're typically going to use NSAIDs for um, suppression of inflammation, and that's called a non-disease modifying drug. So it reduces symptoms, but it doesn't actually reduce the underlying inflammation or the underlying um, autoimmune disorder. So NSAIDs and steroids are typically considered non-disease modifying. If you gave steroids in a high enough dose, it would be disease modifying, but you also dramatically increase the adverse effects. So we typically don't like to give steroids at high doses for those patients. Most of your disease modifying drugs are going to be immunosuppressants. They'll often use um, biologics like Humira, and they'll also use um, cytotoxic drugs such as azathioprine or mecaptopurine. Any questions about rheumatoid arthritis? And then that leads us to gouty arthritis. So do you remember the problem in gout? Increased uric acid levels. So when you have increased uric acid levels combined with more acidic blood, that leads to a condition where you can create little uric acid crystals. And those little uric acid crystals act like little razor blades. And it causes joint damage. When you damage the joints, what does that cause? Inflammation. What is the first two signs and symptoms of inflammation? Redness and heat. What causes the, what causes the redness and heat? Vasodilation, which lets more blood flow to the area, which allows more little razor blades to go to the area, which, you know, kinds of causes like a little, you know. So, um, the classic place to get it is in the first joint of the big toe. So, um, first digit of the big toe. So, imagine for a moment that this is a foot, not a hand. This is what we mean by the first digit, so it's the big toe. Now, you've got a distal joint and a proximal joint, right? Which of these two joints is typically affected in gout? It's going to be the proximal joint. Now, just because that's typical doesn't mean it's the only joint that can be, that can be affected, and you can have patients who have more than one joint affected. Um, gout is extremely painful. Um, I used to, there's this guy I follow on Facebook who has gout, and he had this really like poetic description of the pain and how bad it was. I, unfortunately, I lost it several years ago, but he would say it's like the most exquisite pain you can possibly imagine. He's like, you can't even let the sheet touch your foot because it will just cause unbelievable shock waves of pain throughout your body. And it's like, you can't sleep and you can't do this and you can't do that. And it's like, just how horrible it was. So gout is a disease of, and it's an episodic disease. So you have periods with no symptoms and then you'll have flares. So during an acute flare, what's the treatment? Okay, well, it's an NSAID, and endomethacin, for some reason, got a reputation very early on as good for, for um, gout. But it can be any NSAID. And then a drug called colchizine. How does colchizine work? No, it does not. Okay, so it's going to prevent infiltration of white blood cells into the inflamed area, which is going to decrease the inflammation. Two big adverse effects to watch out for. The first one is diarrhea, and that is typically dose dependent. So a lot of times what you'll see them prescribe is they'll say, use colchizine, you take like double the dose the first dose, and then, one, and then the normal dose every two hours after that, until either your pain subsides or the diarrhea gets too bad. Now, there's some people who say, well, that's a terrible way of prescribing it, but then they don't really come up with anything better, so.
<laughs> sticking with that one. So um, that's colchicine. And then colchicine can also cause, in large doses or even at normal doses, can cause um, leukopenia, potentially fatal. So it can suppress bone marrow growth. And then um, you also want to use drugs that can suppress um, that can suppress uric acid. One of the oldest of those is a drug called allopurinol, which is the brand name. I can never remember the generic, so you're getting the brand name today. And allopurinol works by decreasing the amount of uric acid in the blood by making you increase the urine excretion. But as an adverse effect, it also causes the blood to be more, more acidic. So if you give it to a patient who's having a flare for the first time, like they've never had it before, you put them on it at the time you're having a flare, what does it do to the flare? It makes it worse because the acidity increases before the uric acid level decreases. So you never start it during the flare. What if the patient's already on it during a flare? Don't take them on. Then you leave them on it. Okay. Um, can you explain one more time how it works? One more time how it works? Yeah. It works by, by increasing the secretion of uric acid in the urine. Okay. So in lay terms, it makes you pee out uric acid. Okay. Now, let's talk just for a moment about risk factors for uric acid. The first one is high purine foods. Because <clears throat> purine gets metabolized into uric acid. Now, as it turns out, um, we used to call this a disease of the rich people because you know rich people could afford things like red meat and wine, red wine, which had a lot of purines in them. But as it turns out, things like chicken also are very high in purines. So one of the reasons it's called a disease of the rich people is because a rich person was rich enough to afford enough of those foods to become fat. And being overweight is actually one of the biggest risk factors for um, getting gout. A person who eats high purine foods but is not overweight is much less likely to get gout than someone who eats high purine foods who is also overweight. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, once you've lost weight, the risk of getting it goes down. So anyway, um, you know, people are like, you can't eat that red meat, that'll give you gout. Meanwhile, they're eating lots of chicken. I'm like, well, the chicken has even more purines sometimes than red meat. So that that's not a correct assumption. Does like, gout cause any deformities? Gout can cause deformities over time called TOFI. So it's it's um, a chronic change that occurs when it's not treated adequately and it goes chronic. Um, and they can cause basically destruction of the joint replaced with like, like large bony areas called TOPHI. T-O-P-H-Y. P-H-I. Not on your test. But if you, if you uh, Google that, you'll see x-ray images of what it looks like. And actually, cadaver images too. All right, any questions about gout? What, you said those are the treatments for... Um, what about chronic? Um, well, the chronic is going to be weight management, diet management, and drugs that decrease um, uric acid like allopurinol. Did I answer your question? Okay. Next, we're going to do osteoporosis. All right, so what does osteo mean? Bone. What does porosis mean? Pores. Presence of pores. So your bones are going to turn into Swiss cheese. For those of you who don't know what Swiss cheese is, it's a cheese characterized by holes in it. Okay, so it's caused by a decrease in bone density. Now, what is bone made of? Calcium. In part. 
Okay, bone is made of a collagen matrix, which is a protein, that is then filled in with calcium phosphate mineral. Now, when we see bones, we mostly see dead bones. So we think of bone as like a rock. But in fact, bone is living tissue and is constantly being broken down and rebuilt all of the time in your body. So there are two major hormones that determine whether bone is being broken down or built up. What are those two hormones? Calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. And we learned about those in Pathopharm 1. Do those really care that much about your bone or do they primarily care about something else? What, what, is, what do parathyroid hormone and calcitonin really care more about? They do care about the blood level of calcium. So they're going to maintain a fairly stable level of calcium in the blood and bone is one of the reservoirs where we can either draw calcium from or put calcium into in order to maintain stable calcium levels. Does that make sense? Okay. The ability to remodel bone, which is to destroy it and regrow it, is necessary for us to repair broken bones. If we didn't have that ability, once you broke a bone, well, that'd be the end of it. You can't ever fix it. Right? Okay. So, um, the bone remodeling is a very important process that occurs in our body for two reasons. One is to maintain calcium, and the other is to be able to fix broken repair broken, bro broken bones. Oh, by the way, I brought you guys cookies today. Oh, that was nice. All right, gonna have to cut that part out. <laughs> can't have other people thinking I'm going to bring them cookies. Yeah. No cookies for you. <laughs> All right. I wonder what the person who edits these things. That's me. Oh, you edit that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Highlight that part. Yeah. Uh, where were we now? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, the amount of calcium phosphorus in our bones determines the density of those bones. And like most of the processes in our body, it's adaptive. So the more stress you put on bones, the denser they will become. So one of the best ways to get dense bones is to use your bones in a way that would kind of drive bone growth. So that's typically going to be described as weight-bearing exercise. Now, what, would, what do we mean by weight-bearing exercise? Yeah, where you're bearing your own body weight. So we don't necessarily mean lifting two-pound dumbbells. That, that's not weight-bearing. Now, what happens if you put a, a barbell on your back and then you squat? Would that be weight-bearing? Yeah. yeah. So that would actually increase bone better than just, say, walking. Um, walking is going to increase your bone density more than swimming. Why would swimming not be very effective? Because it's not weight-bearing. Weight now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't swim. It just means that it won't necessarily increase your bone density. Um, another thing that can actually increase bone density is breaking things. I don't necessarily mean breaking your bones. But like people who break boards with their fists, you know, like karate people, actually will over time build up more dense bones than usual. So... The best way to make sure you have nice, fragile bones is not to do anything. Just sit down, take a load off, relax, and chill. And then you can actually further decrease your bone density by doing a few other things, such as okay. smoking. What else? What about drugs? Are there any drugs you could do? Steroids. Steroids. And then there's one last thing that we need to mention, which is you can choose the wrong parents. <laughs> yeah. So typically, oh, the, the, the smaller you are, the, the, they call it stature. Stature just means height. The smaller you are, the more likely you are to also get osteoporosis, partly because you have less body mass, so there's less weight bearing because you don't weigh as much. So sorry, short people in the room. Um, so choosing the parents who gave you short genes, that's one thing you can do. 
And then another thing you can do is your ethnicity. So Asians are the most likely, statistically speaking, to have osteoporosis. And then whites and Hispanics kind of in the middle, and then blacks are the least likely to have um, osteoporosis. So in terms of the genetic lottery, you would want to have tall black parents. Get right on that. <laughs> oh, I guess adoption doesn't help. Man. Okay, so anyway, um, those are kind of the risk factors for osteoporosis. Your genetics, your height, your, um, you know, your activity level, and then smoking and steroids, and there's a few others, but they're farther down on the list. Now, as we grow, when we're first born, do we have very hard, dense bones, or do we have soft, flexible bones? Soft and flexible. So if you've ever felt a baby's head, it's like, first of all, there's a hole in the middle, and then there, there is like, it's flexible. Why is that? So they can pop through that birth canal, partly, partly because their head is going to grow over the next few years. So as they get older, what happens to the bone density? It gets harder and harder until you, you guys are all very stubborn, hard-headed people. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, right. Did, wrong kind of hard. Um, so as you get older, your bones will actually get more dense. So it typically looks like this. If you plot bone density versus age on a chart, start off pretty soft, and then it goes up pretty quick. And then around age 18 is where it begins to level off, but it'll still increase up until about age 30-ish. And then it begins to decline. Now, when did you take this turn for the downwards? <laughs> Menopause. Mm. Mm. So remember we said that estrogen is protective for bone. So when you decrease, when you decrease estrogen during menopause, that's when you actually have a much higher risk of osteoporosis. Now, what about men? So men still have an increased risk of menopause, or sorry, not menopause, uh, increased risk of um, osteoporosis, but it typically doesn't happen until around age 80. And that's because testosterone stays higher longer in men. But they will both have risk, increased risk for it. Men just get it later. Finally, one, one place where it's better to be a man, medically speaking. You know, women live longer than men, right? Mm -hmm. And they have fewer illnesses than men, they have better immune systems than men. We gotta get something out of the, out of the deal, right? But aren't they more susceptible to autoimmune diseases? Yeah, it's because your immune system works better. But yes, okay, so something else, we don't get as many autoimmune diseases. Whew, it's great to be a man, <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, um, so, Statistically speaking, this is what happens. So one of the major things that we want to do to try and avoid osteoporosis is have you increase your calcium intake during these years here. By increasing your calcium intake here and here, what will happen, hopefully? Hopefully it'll look more like this. So like around 18 to 30? Do you want to increase it? Yes. So by increasing your calcium intake when you're young, hopefully your, your bones will be denser throughout your early adult life. So that way you have more place to fall. So basically what we're doing is we're just shifting your, um, we're shifting the time that you get osteoporosis outward. Does that make sense? Then if you can also keep your calcium level as high here, it'll push it out even farther. It's not that you will ever get it necessarily, but, but you're going to push it out so far that you don't get it until after you die of something else. Does that make sense? Now, what are the major symptoms of osteoporosis? Loss of height. Okay, loss of height. Why would we have loss of height? Compression of the spine. So. Compression of the spine? That sounds painful. Does it hurt? I guess, I don't know. So, your vertebrae should be stacked 
kind of on top of each other like this, right? And what's in the what's in the center of the cartilage? cartilage. Uh, not what's what's the fancy name for it? Yes. Intervertebral. Intervertebral discs, right? So, and then what comes out from in between these things? Nerves. Okay, so what can happen in osteoporosis is these actually have compression fractures where they can't hold the weight of your body up and they kind of collapse. But they don't collapse straight downwards. They collapse kind of into a little bit of a triangular shape. What do you notice is happening to the shape of the spine now? It's curving. Now, if it curves this way, what do we call that? Kyphosis. If it curves this way, what do we call that? Scoliosis. So, in addition to the loss of height, patients will also have increased curvature of their spine. Now, what I want everyone to do is to lean forward like this, round your shoulders, and hunch over as much as you can. Now, take a big breath. Can you take a big breath? No, not very effectively, right? So, patients who have this sort of change are going to have a more difficult time taking good, effective breaths. And because we've got these, these spinal nerves that can potentially be pinched, that can also cause chronic pain. So it's not as benign as you lose height. You lose height, you in have increased curvature of the spine, and that can lead to decreased ventilation and chronic pain. So um, I, knew, I knew a woman who had um, an autoimmune disorder where they were giving her a fairly high dose of steroids to treat her disorder. In about four years' time, she lost six inches of height. And she was in chronic back pain because of the pinched nerves. So, and then um, my, my uh, wife's grandmother lived to be 100 years old. I think maybe she's 101. But... I always thought that she had a deformity of her um, scapula because she had this like big ridge right here. And what, as it turned out later, I figured out that was her spine. So her spine was so curved that this looked like it was the ridge of her scapula over here. So, I mean, you know, talk about it. If you have COPD or some other problem where you have trouble breathing to begin with, that can really exacerbate that. Would you even like do surgery? Like, what would you do? At that point, no. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So should like people who are younger take calcium supplements? I don't know. Should they? Yeah. Okay. So should you take a calcium supplement? And the answer is, yeah. it depends. Now, ideally, you would get as a younger person thirteen hundred. Um, milligrams of calcium daily from your diet. diet. But if you don't get enough from your diet, then you should supplement. supplement. So what you should do is keep track of the foods you eat and see how much calcium is in them. And if you don't, then supplement. you can supplement. Now, what is the best way to get your, cal your, get your calcium? Dairy products are by far the best. They have the most amount of calcium in them per calorie, per dose. And it's also a more absorbable form. But Dr. Heeman, there's a lot of calcium in greens. Spinach has a lot of calcium, you know. But it also has a lot of oxalates. You know what oxalates do to calcium? They bind to it, and then you can't absorb it. So you poop it out. So. Calcium, I mean, yeah, it does have a relatively large amount of calcium in it, but it's not that well absorbed. And to get enough calcium just eating spinach, you might have kidney stones or something. So, so one of the things that you should look at is how much calcium you're getting, but then also realistically, you know, oh yeah, I, I eat high calcium foods, but do you eat enough of them? Um, so... Effectively, dairy is probably the best delivery mechanism thereof. What if you're lactose intolerant? 
two options for you. One is you can use like a product like Lactaid, which is basically lactase. Um, some milks have pre-digested the lactose in them. So what is lactose intolerance, by the way, first of all? Okay, so when we're, when we're infants, we all can, can absorb and digest lactose. So lactose is a, a sugar. It's um, one glucose, one galactose. And then you have to break that bond apart with this particular enzyme. Now, in most of the world's population, that enzyme turns off after a certain age. As you get older, it turns off. What's the mechanism of turning things off? Epigenetics. Actually, epigenetics. yeah, epigenetic changes. So, but in certain population, about 30%, primarily Northern Euro European descent, they actually, and then also some tribes in Africa, they maintain that gene being on their entire lives. So they will not be lactose intolerant. So when you don't have that gene turned on, you can't break the lactose bond yourself. So it travels down into your lower intestines where bacteria ferment it, causing release of carbon dioxide and gas. And that causes bloating and discomfort. So that's what we mean by lactose intolerant. So one is you can take lactose supplements or you can drink a milk product that has got the pre-digested stuff. Another is that you could use something like um, yogurt because yogurt's already been pre-digested. You've broken down the lactose. Um, another option, which is more recent, is a product called Fairlife. Um, they have this stuff, it's called uh, Fairlife Quality Nutrition Plan or something like that. 30, 30 grams high protein quality, something like, can't remember. I've got a picture of it on my phone. We'll, put, we'll post it in the video for you. Um, but the cool thing about this stuff is that, well, first of all, it has 30 grams of um, calcium in it, which is a lot of calcium. Why isn't it showing up? Yeah, almond milk is just supplemented with calcium, so it's like taking a calcium supplement. Yeah. Um, I object to calling almond milk milk. It's more like flavored water. And soy milk, that's like the worst of all. Yeah. It's not, it's not milk. It's, it's like, yes, exactly. It's like oat broth. I mean, that's really what it is. Oat broth. There you go. But anyway, um, so the, the Fairlife stuff has a large amount of calcium. It has basically only two grams of sugar in it. The lactose is pre-digested but it has like 700 milligrams of calcium. No thanks. <laughs> it's, not bad. it's not bad. People like babies before, like older kids yeah. stuff. Yeah. So the nice thing about, the, um, about that fair life stuff is that it only has 150 calories. So, so anyway, um, if, if I were lactose intolerant, that's the one I would do. Um, actually, that's my breakfast nowadays. 30 grams of protein and only 150 calories, and, no and it has calcium. Oh, it's dairy. It's basically filtered milk. It's ultra-filtered milk. But lactose What? The lactose has been, has been pre-digested. So there's technically no lactose in it. It's now uh, glucose and galactose separate. So anyway, that's an option for someone who's lactose intolerant. Um, you can also get it from supplements. The important thing to remember is that when you're looking at the numbers, what you're looking at is, what you want to look at is not the total amount of calcium carbonate or calcium citrate, but the total amount of calcium. Does that make sense? So most of the manufacturers nowadays don't, don't even advertise the amount of calcium of the entire molecule. They only advertise the amount of the calcium itself. So just look on the package and see, contains X amount of calcium. Okay. You typically don't want to take in too much calcium at one time because what that'll do is it'll increase calcitonin too high, which in turn will reduce the, um, reduce the absorption of the calcium. So if you're taking calcium supplements, Let's say that, you know, I don't want to take a chance. I'm going to take 1,000 milligrams a day. Don't take all 1,000 milligrams at once. 
take like 500 in the morning and then take 500 at night. And that way you'll reduce the amount of calcitonin that is secreted during that process. <coughs> All right, um, now in addition to calcium, what else do you need to do to be able to absorb calcium? Did I say in addition to calcitonin? Or did I say, yeah. in addition to calcium itself, what else do you need to absorb it? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. Where do we get vitamin D from? The sun. the sun. And we're in Florida, so it's easy. Yeah, Florida has the highest percentage of fake tans in the, in the country, by the way. Want to know why that is? Because it's too hot to go out in the sun. <laughs> and, and we're too busy, but we need to look like it anyway. Um, we recently, for the 4th of July, we're at a pool party, and we're like, man, all of the kids are like super tan, and all of the adults are like white as a ghost. Because it's just too busy to go out in the sun. Um, and when we do go out in the sun, we're too afraid of skin cancer, so we don't actually allow ourselves to get the vitamin D production because we're all covered up in hats and sunscreened up. So in the United States, there is actually a, um, an epidemic of low vitamin D. Now, the clinical significance of that is, is uh, somewhat contested. So there is some research to suggest that there's no reason to screen you for calcium D deficiency. Sorry, vitamin D, calcium D. There's no reason to screen you for vitamin D deficiency unless you already have symptoms of something else. Um, but there is that epidemic of low vitamin D, which could potentially cause a number of problems, one of which could be decreased calcium absorption. In the United States, the main way we get our calcium is through, or our main way we get our vitamin is in foods that have vitamin D fortification. And most dairy products do have vitamin D added in. All right, any questions about vitamin D and calcium? What if you're vegan and milk isn't an option and neither is yogurt or whatever? Well, I guess you're going to be stuck with spinach and other stuff. So that leads us to, you, if you're vegan, you probably do want to supplement with a calcium supplement. So the major calcium supplement that's used most of the time is calcium carbonate, which we've already talked about in Pathofarm 1, but a quick reminder, it's also used as a, um, it's also used as a um, antacid. And one of the major adverse effects of calcium carbonate is constipation. It's not super well absorbed, but you know we pretend that it's the same as everything else. Then we have got calcium citrate, which doesn't have as much constipation and is better absorbed, but is also more expensive. And then we have also have calcium gluconate, which most of the time is going to be given IV. Is it dangerous? Well, I mean, yes, but low calcium is more dangerous than high calcium, so there you go. It's not like giving magnesium. Okay. I feel like this is a dumb question, but if you have low calcium, would your B comes from it? So it's calcium carbonate? Calcium carbonate, yes. Huh. Yep. By far the most common calcium supplement is calcium carbonate, and that can be used for low calcium levels as well as prevention or treatment of osteoporosis. Now, the number one thing about osteoporosis is that we don't want to get it. So what's the most important thing? Prevention. prevention. How do we prevent it? Okay. Avoid risk factors. <laughs> avoid the avoidable risk factors. You can't choose your parents or your height. Sorry. Um, so avoid the ones you can't avoid. And then weight-bearing exercise and adequate calcium. So when you're young, typically you want 1,300 uh, milligrams, and then it goes, depending on your age, you can go down to about 1,000 milligrams, um, and then in this stage, typically 1,200 milligrams. What was the first one? 1,300? 1,300, then 1,000, and 12. Yeah. It also depends on your risk group, but you can look it up, it's not a big deal. No one's gonna, no, in fact, no one's gonna ask you the number of milligrams you need. So just remember, the average person needs somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 milligrams per day, most of which should come from your diet.
Okay. Prevention is by far way, way better than treatment. What's the best way to prevent it? Decrease your risk factors, weight-bearing exercise, calcium supplementation. All right. Now, how do we know a person has osteoporosis? Dexa scan. What is a DEXA scan? All right, so it is a bone density scan. So DEXA How is that different from a bone scan? So this is looking at the density of your body, including your bones. A bone scan is where we inject a radioactive substance into your body, it's absorbed by the bones, and then we see if your bones either absorbed it or didn't. So we use that to check to see if your bones are dead, osteonecrosis, and we use it to see if you have bone metabolism and cancer. It is not used to see if you have osteoporosis. Can we all agree that we're not gonna get that wrong on the test? Who wants to get it wrong? On, who wants to volunteer to get it wrong on the test? All right, we have one volunteer. The rest of you, I expect you to get it right. DEXA for bone density. So how many of you have seen the movie Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith? You know at the beginning of the movie when he's selling those machines? That's a DEXA scan. So it was in the early 80s before osteoporosis was like really wide known. And so he's like on the cutting edge of medicine, but he was a little too ahead of his time and had a hard time selling the machines. Because back then, doctors were like, what's this? So now everybody knows it, everybody does it, not as, it's, much more common now. Um, so, DEXA, bone density. Now, how many of you remember statistics? One person, two people? How many of you are good at math? Mm. Yeah. What's it called when you have something that looks like this? A normal distribution. And what's special about a normal distribution? Well, in the center, three things are all the same. What are those three things? The mode, the median, and the mean, or the average. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it means that in the center is where it's the highest. Okay, that's fine. Now, there's another, so these are called measures of central tendency. The middle tends to have the mean, the mode, and the median all the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, you also have a measure of variance, which how far out it goes. What's that called? Standard deviation. Now, what's special about a normal distribution is that plus or minus one standard deviation is going to be about 66% of all cases. Right? If you go out two standard deviations, it's about 95% of all cases, right? Now, when it comes to osteoporosis, we don't care about the up direction. If you are more dense than usual, we don't care. All we care about is standard deviation in the downward direction. And there's two cutoffs. One of them, we're, gonna, we're not gonna call it osteoporosis, but you got some bone loss, and that's gonna be called osteo. Penia. And what is the standard deviation associated with osteopenia? For those of you looking at the notes. One standard, one, de one standard deviation. So if you are one standard deviation down, we're going to call that osteopenia. And then if you are how much farther down? One point five down that is going to be called osteoporosis. So it's not an absolute measure, it's a measure that was derived from looking at averages. So the average person, if you are one standard deviation down from an average person, that's going to be considered osteopenia. 
If a person is 1.5 standard deviations down, that is called osteoporosis. Now, a person at one standard deviation down, osteopenia, is already at risk, higher risk, for fractures. Oh, when we we're talking about signs and symptoms, I forgot. So in addition to the bone loss, the loss of height, we also have increased risk of fractures. Uh, now, what's, what's the big fracture risk that we really worry about the most? Femoral neck. Femoral neck. What does that mean? Like your, hip. your hip joint? Okay. What is... All right, let's see. New color. All right, so your femur... That's terrible, but hey, femur looks something kind of like. <laughs> Let's do that again. There we go. Okay, something looking kind of like that. It doesn't look anything like that, but hey, <clears throat> what's this? What's this part over here called? You have no idea. No. All right, we'll learn it. It might be on your chest, it might not. Then, what's this part right here called? That's the femoral joint. No, that's the femoral joint. What's the part that goes into the hip socket called? <laughs> the head. <laughs> the acetabulum, does that ring a bell? Yeah. Uh, no. What? No. <laughs> Okay. okay, I'll give you a hint. This is called a trochanter. A greater and a lesser trochanter. So, and then what's this little part in between, in the middle? This is the femoral neck. So, how is that broken? You fall down on your side and you hit it like this. And so, it's being hit from the side like that, and it's shearing it sideways. So when you break this femoral neck, that's called breaking your hip. Now, when I was younger, little kid, when I heard that someone broke their hip, in my head, they broke their pelvis. That's, that's a way worse fracture, by the way. Um, so when we say break your hip, this is what we primarily mean. Now, in a younger person, I mean, it's a big deal. It's, it's not very fun. It's a long road to recovery, but it's not that big a deal. But in an elderly person, it can mean the end of their independence. And even if they do fully recover, the, a lot of times they're never quite the same. But within one year of breaking their hip, about 50% of people will be dead. So breaking their hip is kind of like a significant health event that can number one, kill them, or set in motion things that kill them, and number two, cause significant loss of independence. So that risk for fracture is really, really important. And the risk of fracture, as, as predicted by um, bone density, is one of the highest correlations that we have in the medical world. So it's actually, you're more likely to break your hip from having a low, or more likely to have a fracture from having a low uh, bone density score than you are to have a stroke from having high blood pressure or a heart attack with cholesterol. So really high predictor, very high um, both mortality rate and uh, loss of function rate. So that's why we care so much about osteoporosis. It's because, well, with the spinal stuff, you have that loss of height, which can lead to chronic pain and increased risk of respiratory complications. And if you break your hip, it can lead to death and or loss of independence. And even if you do fully recover, it can be several months before you get back to being normal. And in the meantime, hard to be kind of independent when you can't get out of bed. All right, now what about treatments? How do we treat osteoporosis or osteopenia? You've been diagnosed now, you've got it. What do we do? 
Well, the very first thing, and nothing else we do will work if we don't do the first thing. And the first thing is, no, it's too late. The patient's got it now. Calcium. So calcium and vitamin D is the first thing. If you've got osteoporosis, the first thing is we've got to make sure you have adequate calcium and vitamin D. If we don't have that, none of the other stuff will work. Then number two is we want to treat them in some other way. So the most common drugs nowadays are um, bisphosphonates. So the way that bisphosphonates work is that in the bone cycle, remember you've got, you've got bone that's going to be destroyed by an osteoclast, a bone eater, and then you're going to have an osteoblast build the bone back up. So what happens is in that cycle, so you've got the breakdown here, and then you've got the build back up here. Um, So what happens is, you take the drug, the drug is in your system, the bone gets broken down, and as the osteoblast builds it back up, it incorporates the bone with the drug inside it. So the drug actually becomes part of the bone. So remember, what's bone made of? Calcium phosphate. So this phosphonate, it incorporates into the bone. Now. It's time for the osteoclast to eat the bone again, and it doesn't like the taste of the drug, so it doesn't eat as much of the bone. So it reduces the rate of bone resorption. Reduces the rate of bone breakdown. How do bisphosphonates work? They reduce the rate of bone breakdown. Um, now, as far as the way you take these, it the oldest two drugs are both taken by mouth. So, alendronate and I forget, resendronate, I want to say, but so Fosamax and Activa. Sorry, that's a, that's a yogurt. Actonel. <laughs> Fosamax and Actonel. <laughs> They're both taken by mouth, and they can be taken either every day or once a week. Generally speaking, it's better to take them once a week. They have to be taken in a very specific way in order to reduce the risk of erosive esophagitis. So if you take them wrong, they can eat away the patient's esophagus. So they need to take them first thing in the morning, empty stomach, that's in order to, absor to maximize absorption. You take it with a full glass of water, that's to make sure it washes down all the way into the stomach and there's no res residue left in the esophagus. And then you remain in the seated position for at least 30 minutes. And that's because if you lie back down, you know, so as the drug dissolves, some of it might go up into your esophagus. To prevent esophageal what? Erosive esophagitis. Eros like erode, mm -hmm. erosive esophagitis. So, patient's going to take it first thing in the morning, empty stomach, full glass of water, nothing to eat or drink, and remaining in the sitting position for the next 30 minutes. Does that make sense? Take it with water, not with coffee. Yeah. Um, and if you do that once a week instead of every day, your risk of getting erosive esophagitis goes down because you only have to do it that way once, and you've got six days where you're not taking it so you're not at risk those days. So do you just take a larger dose? Yes, yeah. So if let's say you were gonna take uh, 10 milligrams a day, if you do it weekly, you just take 70 milligrams all at once. Oh, okay. um, and then there's some newer drugs that one of them is taken once a month. The high one? Yeah, ibendronate. And then there's another one that can actually be taken once a year. That one is injection only, so you've got to go to your doctor, they inject, I think it's IV infusion actually. So they, you go to your doctor, they infuse it into you, and then you go home and you're good for a year. I, um, 
I can't remember offhand. Yeah, not on your test. You can look it up. I'll put it on the test and you can look it no. up. Okay, fine, be that way. <laughs> So um, those are bisphosphonates. Now, the other thing that can occur with bisphosphonates we need to be aware of is potential for osteonecrosis. So that is death of the bone. That is most common in the mandible, and it's most commonly in patients who are at much higher doses than for osteoporosis. One of the other potential uses for bisphosphonates is to reduce the risk of metastasis to the bone in cancer. So if, you're, if a patient has cancer, sometimes the cancer spreads to the bones. And by taking bisphosphonates, you reduce the risk or and the rate of that bone cancer spread. So you're, when you use bisphosphonates for that purpose, you use much higher doses, and that's where the risk of the um, osteonecrosis occurs. So every now and then you run into a patient who's like, I have Google, and Google tells me that this could cause osteonecrosis, and I don't want my jaw to fall off. <laughs> and then you can tell them, well, I understand that is a big risk, and I wouldn't want my jaw to fall off either. <laughs> However, that risk was in patients who take much, much higher doses because they have cancer, not because they're trying to prevent or treat osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. So that, bisphosphonates are probably the most common one that you'll see these days. Next, we have a drug called raloxifene or Evista. And this is a partial estrogen agonist. What do you mean by partial? The effects of it only affects some receptors. Now, the interesting thing is by by activating some receptors, it also has the potential to block others. So it can actually cause hot flashes and mood swings because it's enough like estrogen that it can block estrogen from attaching to normal receptors. Um, so basically what it does is it activates the receptors for estrogen in the bone, thereby reducing the amount of bone loss. Any questions there? And then the next one is calcitonin. The brand name is Mia Calcin. Doesn't work very well in terms of rebuilding bone, but it's an option, I suppose. It can come as a pill and also as a nose spray. It also helps to reduce bone loss. Now, the next drug is the only drug that we're going to talk about today that actually builds up bone, and that is called Forteo. Um, that's the brand name. The generic name is too hard to pronounce and spell. Actually, it's not true. I just like to forget it. I think it's like para, teraparatide. Yeah, teraparatide, something like that. So this is artificial parathyroid hormone. Now. What do we know about parathyroid hormone? It steals calcium from bone. Okay, let me get this straight. The disease is caused by not enough calcium in the bone, and now I'm gonna give a drug that steals more calcium from the bone. Can you explain to me how that works? Are you gonna explain? Uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's encouraging uh, reformation of bone. How? by low doses or intermittent doses. How does intermittent dosing... Because when you break down the bone, all CO glands come back to fix it. So if you do it intermittently, it's promoting huh. bone growth. Okay. I, I need an ordinary volunteer for my next trick. Who wants to be on camera for a moment? All right, come on up. All right, so... What I want you to do is I want you to put your hand right there. Right there. Okay, your hand's there. No, no, just put, put your hand there. Just don't, do, don't do anything else. Okay? Why are you pushing? Did I tell you to push? No, I automatically do it. She's automatically, you see that? She just automatically pushes. She's a pushy person. All right, bring your hand right here again. Okay, no, don't, don't move your body, just hand right there. Okay. 
Now, I'm going to push on your hand, push back. <coughs> what happened when I put my hand away? Try again. <laughs> what happened when I took my hand away? She kept pushing, right? <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. So, <laughs> when we dose with Forteo intermittently, your body pushes back stronger, which is what causes more calcium to be incorporated into the bone. So pretty much what you said, but I just had to push somebody around because it's more fun. That's okay. okay. So when you dose Forteo intermittently, when the patient is on the drug for a short amount of time, you actually steal calcium out of the bone. But when you take the patient off it, you get a rebound effect and it actually pushes more calcium into the bone. Okay. All right. Any other questions about osteoporosis? All right, let's take a break. All right, while I delete this screen, I want you to take out a piece of paper and I want you to sketch a nephron. Pop quiz. <laughs> Sketch it on your, sketch it with your laptop. Don't ask me to give you the answers to this pop quiz. She doesn't have paper. What are you missing in your in your little diagram? Something at the beginning and something at the end. Uh, I don't. Well, they're not like in the right spot. It's, it's a very loose drawing, Dr. Heyman. <laughs> Oh. Okay, so we've established that most of you don't remember it. So we've got arteries coming in and arteries coming out. Out of what? The glomerulus. Okay, so the artery going in is called the afferent. The artery coming out is called the efferent. What's this whole area called? The whole thing is called the glomerulus. Glomerulus. What's the, this part right here on the outer part called? Bowman's capsule. Then the swirly part here is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, in real life, it is much more convoluted than that, but hey, we have limitations. And then this bottom part, this is called loop of Henle. And then this part up here, distal convoluted tubule. And then this last part is called the collecting duct. Okay. And then all throughout the, di the distal and proximal convoluted tubule that are not shown are little capillaries. So in, those ca in the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule, the arteries are interacting with those tubules, secreting additional substances and pulling some substances out. So the things that we pull out is called resorption. So one of the things we pull out, for example, is glucose. And then the things that we put in is called secretion. So coming into this, into this artery, into the glomerulus, how much stuff gets filtered from the blood into the proximal convoluted tubule? What gets filtered in, what gets filtered out? Okay, so let's go back to the components of blood for a moment. So we have <laughs> water, electrolytes, proteins, and then we have cells. What are the three types of cells? Red, 
Red, white, and blue. I mean, um, <laughs> red, white, and platelets. Okay. So, what gets filtered into here, and what doesn't? What stays in the blood? Okay, proteins and cells do not get filtered. Yeah, that's right. Everything else does. Does that make sense? So what is the little liquid in, in this part called? Filtrate. It just got filtered, so we call it filtrate. Okay, so as the filtrate goes through the proximal convoluted tubule, the most important thing that happens is we're going to suck sodium back out. Does that make sense? About 60% of the sodium that was filtered comes back in at this point, or gets pulled back out of the filtrate. Then in the loop of Henle, it's about 20%. In the distal convoluted tubule, it's about 10%. I think I've got something wrong here. 65. Yeah, my math wasn't working out. And then here in the, in the collecting duct, it's about 3%. So how much sodium ends up in the very final urine? Only about 2% of the sodium that got filtered out ends up in urine. So most of the sodium does what? It gets reabsorbed. Now, what is it that the only part, this is pretty constant, this is pretty constant, this is pretty constant. Only this part here at the end changes. And what is it that tells this part at the end to change? Well, it is sodium potassium pumps. And it's the number of sodium potassium pumps that changes. When your body wants to absorb, resorb more sodium, what does it do? It makes more sodium potassium pumps. So you've got these little sodium potassium pumps. What goes into the urine? Potassium. What comes out of the urine? Sodium. Okay. Now, what determines the number of these little pumps that exist there? aldosterone, which is a hormone produced by the adrenal cortex. Okay, so if we want there to be more sodium retention, what do we do? Have more aldosterone. The aldosterone goes into the, into the cell, the nuclei of these cells here, and says produce more Sodium potassium pumps. So more potassium will be secreted into the urine and more sodium will be resorbed into the blood. Does that make sense? How long does it take that process to occur? From the moment you secrete the aldosterone till you start getting that increased sodium retention. Couple days. Couple days. Because you're actually having to synthesize new proteins and then assemble them and put them in the right place. Okay. Um, what follows the sodium? Water. So as you build up, as you pull sodium out, more water will come out also. If you leave more sodium in, what will that do to urine production? Increase urine production. Okay. Um, any questions about the overall process now? Okay, so what we're gonna do at this moment in time is we're gonna learn some drugs, diuretic drugs. So these are drugs that increase the amount of urine. The way that most of them work is by inhibiting the resorption of sodium. Now, there's three different places we're going to do it. The first one is in the loop, the second is in the distal convoluted tubule, and the third is at the sodium potassium pump. Which of these do you think is going to be stronger? Ones that inhibit resorption here, here, or here? The ones that inhibit in the loop are going to be the strongest. And we call those, you'll never guess, loop diuretics. I guess you did learn, or did guess. Loop diuretics. So the most common loop diuretic is called furosemide, 
and the generic name is Lasix. Now, interestingly enough, furosemide is a sulfa drug. So if you ever see a patient who is allergic to sulfa but taking Lasix, you know that something ain't right. The way that all of these drugs work, there's a couple others, we're not gonna learn them in this course. Um, so the way that all loop diuretics work is by inhibiting sodium resorption here, which is going to end up more sodium at the bottom, which is also gonna result in more water at the bottom. So, in a drug that does that, what do you think the major adverse effects are going to be? Say again? Okay, let's not use the word dehydration. Hypovolemia. Second is, how is it creating the hypovolemia? By getting rid of sodium. So what could that do? Hyponatremia. Now, what electrolyte goes along with sodium? Hypochloremia. All right, now, what's going to happen to potassium? Why would it be hypo? Okay, let's imagine for a moment. Ordinarily, you absorb, resorb, 20% of your sodium here. But because you're on a drug that inhibits that, there's less sodium up here. How's your body going to respond? Aldosterone. aldosterone. So it's going to secrete aldosterone and try and increase the amount of sodium resorption here. How does it do that? By secreting potassium. But can 3% trump 20%? No, so it's not going to help the sodium, but will it have an effect on potassium? Yes. So your potassium levels will go down because you're secreting it into the urine. So three hypos, well, four hypos. The in when you don't have enough sodium, because you're, you're not resorbing as much here, your body will respond to that by secreting aldosterone to try and fix it here. But it's just not enough to fix the sodium, so you're still going to have more sodium secretion than usual. But it will affect the amount of potassium that's leaving. So when it, if you weren't on a loop diuretic, uh -huh. you secrete aldosterone, it's trying to get more sodium in? Yes. Or no. In the yeah. blood. This, this and this are fairly constant under ordinary circumstances. Okay. The only thing that has changed is this. Okay. So you might go from 2% to 3%. Okay. So, but, so if you're inhibiting if you're inhibiting 20% now, will changing 1% over here make a difference in sodium? No, but normally when you secrete aldosterone, what is it's trying to get more sodium layer. In the blood. In the blood. Okay, that's yeah. the question. Okay. Thank you. Bye. So, yeah, so aldosterone causes sodium to be retained in the blood at the expense of secreting potassium into the urine. Thank you. So, when you have that compensatory mechanism as a side effect here, it's not enough to change the outcome with sodium, but it is enough to change the outcome with potassium. So, all of these can potentially be low with loop diuretics. Now, most of the time, what we're wanting to do for this patient is get rid of water. That's the reason we give them in the first place. So this, although it is a concern, is usually not the big problem. The bigger problem out of these three is most likely going to be potassium. You do need to monitor sodium also, but potassium is the most likely to be a big problem. How do you think we might fix that? Well, first of all, what do we want to do about it? Monitor. Monitor. So you want to know lab, you want to know their potassium level. So patients who are receiving diuretics, you should monitor their electrolyte panel, and in particular, their potassium. So let's say the, the potassium is normal. What do we need to do about that? Nothing. Nothing. What if it's low? 
Give potassium. That was pretty easy. So, do you remember Pathopharm 1, we did electrolytes? Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, you need to review those. Oh, I, I mean, I, I said that'll come back to bite you if you don't. So go back and review your electrolytes because if you have to give potassium chloride, you got to know the rules about potassium chloride. Do you remember what they are? No P, no K. No P, no K. And no more than? Uh, well, no more than 10 mil equivalents per hour under ordinary circumstances. In the ICU, you might go up to 20. But under ordinary circumstances, no more than 10. OK. Um, for loop diuretics, the number one reason we're going to give them is in heart failure. You can also give loop diuretics in early kidney failure. They'll increase um, kidney function during early kidney failure. And you can also use them for edema. If the patient has edema, you can use it to reduce edema. And you can also use it to reduce high blood pressure. But they don't last that long, so they don't work that well for high blood pressure. So typically not just for high blood pressure, but you could. You can give it either PO or IV. When given PO, it's going to take about two hours to begin and typically lasts about six to eight hours. When you give it IV, it starts working in about 10 minutes and lasts for about two hours. What do you need to be thinking about? Nurse, you should think about this when you give IV Lasix. Okay, one is monitor urine output, okay. But more important than that, what's your patient gonna do? They're gonna pee. So you got to be ready for that. So if it's someone who can, you, who can get up and go to the bathroom by themselves, warn them, hey, you're gonna have to get up and go to the bathroom, so be ready for that. What if it's a person who can't get up and go to the bathroom by themselves? You either need to be ready to help them or provide a urinal, for a man especially, is pretty easy. Your pee in this cup thing, this little bottle. And then put it on your bedside table where your food goes. If it's a woman, well, they do have female urinals, but they don't always work that well. So you just need to be ready for that occurrence. Because if not, what can happen? You're changing the bed every 30 minutes. That's not a very fun way to spend your shift. Your, uh, your CNA will not like you. So make sure that you keep these things in mind. Okay. Um, the easiest is if the patient has a Foley, but you know we're, that's not necessarily the best for the patient. That's just the most convenient for the nurse. And we don't do things for your convenience. We do things for what's best for the patient, hopefully. Anyway, so loop diuretics. Any questions about loop diuretics? All right, next we have what are called thiazide diuretics. Two drugs. Um, one is called hydrochlorothiazide. Isn't that nice? They put the drug class in the name of the drug. This word intimidates a lot of people. How many, say hydro. hydro. Say chloro. Chloro. Say the class name. Thiazide. It's easy. But it's so long. Yeah. Hydrochlorothiazide. It's often abbreviated as HCTZ. Now, the Joint Commission says that in the hospital they can't order HCTZ. They have to write out hydrochlorothiazide. But just be aware that a lot of drugs have combination with hydrochlorothiazide. So if you see a drug name, say for example, low tensin HCT, what that means is there's low tensin in it, which we'll learn about later, and then there's also hydrochlorothiazide in it. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, thiazide diuretics are not nearly as strong as loop diuretics. They work in the distal convoluted tubule. In order for hydrochlorothiazide to work well, you really need to get it up to like 150 to 200 milligrams per day. But this is rarely what ever happens because it starts to become 
toxic and has some other issues associated with it. Most of the time, you're gonna see doses in the range of 6.25 to 25 milligrams per day. It's a long-acting drug, it only needs to be taken once per day. When given in these low doses, it does not really increase urine output that much. But it does increase it enough to help lower blood pressure. So the number one reason we're gonna give hydrochlorothiazide and other thiazide diuretics is for the control of high blood pressure. Stuff is dirt cheap, I'm talking like, you know, 100 pills for $3. I think they even give it away free at Publix. Don't quote me on that. But I mean, it's really cheap. So it's often one of the first drugs that patients will be put on for um, high blood pressure. And it's also used in combination with a number of other high blood pressure drugs. Because anytime you lower a person's blood pressure, your body tries to compensate. One of the ways it tries to compensate is by increasing fluid retention. So giving a very small dose of hydrochlorothiazide increases the effectiveness of any other anti-blood pressure medication. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you see a patient on Lasix, what are they most likely being treated for? Heart failure is the number one. If you see someone on hydrochlorothiazide, what are they most likely being treated for? High blood pressure. Okay. As far as adverse effects, all of these are the same. It's also a sulfa drug. But the risk of these goes down. Why does the risk lower? Because number one, it's not as strong a drug because it works in the distal instead of the, of the loop of Henle. And number two, we don't use that high a dose anymore. And then what about ototoxicity? It, yeah, it it's a potential. Okay. Yeah. And that's not for these? No. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, now, one thing we've got to be careful about yeah, we'll talk about it later. Okay, so the next group is called, and let me get rid of this. The next group is called potassium sparing. Potassium sparing work in the sodium potassium pump, and they come in two forms. One is a direct inhibitor. And the second is aldosterone inhibitors. What do you think a direct inhibitor does? It just inhibits the ability of the sodium potassium pump to do its job. So that'll have a very, very slight effect on urine output, but it will not decrease potassium. In fact, it might increase potassium. Why is that? Because what's the job of the sodium potassium pump? To put potassium where? Into the urine. And if it's not doing that, where does the potassium stay? In the blood. So, by inhibiting the sodium potassium pump, potassium stays in the blood, and potassium levels might even go up slightly. So the drug name there is triamterene. It's a very old drug, and you're pretty much never gonna be, you're never gonna see it by itself. The only time you typically are gonna see that drug is in combination with hydrochlorothiazide. Because hydrochlorothiazide has a potential adverse effect, lowers potassium. And triamterene as a potential adverse effect raises it. So you put them together and it cancels out. Now, the aldosterone inhibitors are typically used for other purposes. They're not, they're not very good at being a diuretic. They don't cause enough diuresis to, cut, to help. But aldosterone 
has a couple effects that are nasty in heart failure. In addition to causing increased fluid retention, it's also gonna cause increased muscle growth of the heart and of the arteries, which can cause increased workload of the heart. So by inhibiting aldosterone, you can actually improve heart failure and blood pressure. So a very old drug is called spironolactone. The brand name is aldactone. And then a newer drug is epleronone. You're supposed to for the cardiovascular test, so why don't we just say yes? You'll need to learn it sometime. So, uh, spironolactone and epleronone. Spironolactone is much, much older. It's also much cheaper, but it has some nasty adverse effects. It can lead to um, anti-androgen effects, which can cause a higher voice in men. <clears throat> I mean, a higher voice in men. Testicular atrophy and gynecomastia. Testicular atrophy. Gyno. Gynecomastia. Um, breast growth in men. I'm just like confused. Can you just go over one more time the main difference of the mechanism of action between the two? You mean between this and this? Yes. All right. So the direct inhibitors inhibit the sodium pump itself. Completely. Yeah, well, I mean, not completely, but that's where they work. So then okay, we'll, uh, potassium will stay in the urine? Potassium will stay in the urine. Okay. Right. The way that aldosterone inhibitors work, what causes more of these to be grown in the first place? Aldosterone. So by inhibiting the effects of aldosterone, you lower the number of these. Okay. So it has the same effect in the urine, okay. but it's such a small effect in the urine that that's not why we're prescribing it. Gotcha. We're prescribing it for the anti-aldosterone effect, okay. which in the case of spironolactone and aplerinone can help heart failure and potentially high blood pressure okay. for aplerinone. Wait, I thought you said the direct inhibitors keep potassium in the blood. Yes. You said, she just said so it'll stay in the urine, and you said yeah. Sorry, I meant blood. <laughs> I assumed she was going to say the right thing, and I guess I'm not a very good listener. It's because I'm a man. So inhibitors, K's, and blood. Yep. It's because I'm a toxic masculinity. So how does that help with urine output? Say that again? That can be a really good question. How does that help with urine output? Okay, so as you ret the whole purpose of aldosterone is to make more of these sodium potassium pumps, mm -hmm. which will pump more sodium out. Mm -hmm. As you pump more sodium out, water follows it. In order to get that sodium out, you put potassium in. Mm -hmm. So as you get more aldosterone, you have more, more sodium and water poten retention and less potassium, because potassium is in the urine. Okay. By inhibiting aldosterone, uh -huh. you have less sodium potassium pumps, which means more sodium will stay here with, water. with the urine, and because the water is there. Yeah, yeah. And then the sodium, or the potassium, is going to stay in the blood. So, all that to say, the aldosterone inhibitors are not used as anti, they're not used as diuretics. They're used as anti-aldosterone agents, primarily in heart failure and to a lesser degree in high blood pressure. Any questions? Spironolactone has a number of nasty adverse effects, primarily anti-androgen effects. High voice, gynecomastia, testicular atrophy. Only spironolactone. Spironolactone, yeah. yeah. Um, and does not have as much of that. Don't ask me if it has any. Look it up instead. All right, any questions about these diuretics? There's one more drug class of diuretics that we need to know, and that is mannitol. Now, looking at the name, mannitol, what do you think mannitol is? <laughs> For those of you who had a chemistry class, what do you think mannitol is? 
things that end in all are usually alcohols. So it's an alcohol that is not absorbed, is not uh, resorbed in the glomerulus. So it gets filtered out and it ends up in the collecting duct. And as it collects in the collecting duct in higher than normal amounts, it attracts water into the collecting duct in a process known as osmotic diuresis. Does that sound familiar? Oh. What other disease process does that occur in? Polyuria. In diabetes mellitus with polyuria. So mannitol is used for two things. One is to help preserve renal function in shock and heart failure patients who are receiving norepinephrine or dopamine. In what patients? Shock or heart failure. So if you'll recall from Pathopharm 1, gosh, I sound like a broken record. Everything I needed to know in nursing school, I learned in Pathopharm 1. So in Pathopharm 1, we talked about the way that dopamine and norepinephrine work is by activating beta 1 and alpha 1. Beta 1, what happens? Heart beats faster and stronger. And then by affecting alpha 1, we get what? Basoconstriction, which is going to raise blood pressure. So the problem is it can also cause vasoconstriction of the renal arteries. If the kidneys don't get enough blood flow, what do they do? They go into failure. So one of the ways we can preserve renal function in a patient who's receiving norepinephrine or dopamine is by giving them mannitol. The other use for mannitol is to suck edema out of the brain. Have we learned another thing that can do that? What is it? Three percent sodium. So, 3% sodium and mannitol can both be used to reduce cerebral edema. Any questions about mannitol? You said that the vasoconstriction of the renal you're using that for renal failure, though? Mm -hmm. All right, on that note, we're going to be done with diuretics. How much time do we have? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. So what? No, it doesn't. It gets out at four twenty. We get out at five thirty. <clears throat> yeah, we're taking the test right after class. <laughs> Yeah, open note is far worse because what happens is that you spend all your time trying to look up the answers and then you run out of time. Yeah. You're better off just knowing it. Question? Yeah, it's actually not as big as you think it is. What? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Easy. Well, let me just cover it. Um, it. We can probably finish all of renal in about 30 minutes or less. So actually, I think I just heard our special guests come. So, so at this moment in time, what we're going to do is we're going to go over urinalysis. So in order to do a urinalysis, what happens? Patient pees in a cup. OK, and now you've got this little sample of urine. Now what happens? So there's a little dipstick, as it's called, which is a little plastic strip that has little pads on it. So you dip that in, and then you, now what do you do? You wait. How long do you wait? Well, it depends. Each pad has a different amount. So some you wait 30 seconds, some you wait 60, and some you wait 120 seconds. No. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. So then, at the right, at the right moment in time, what are you supposed to do? You compare it to the bottle. Does that look like yellow or yellow green? Is that dark yellow green or is that green green? You got to be good at distinguishing colors. So based on the colors that it changes, that's going to 
signify different things. So the very first thing in a urinalysis is typically the presence of white blood cells, leukocytes. And most of the things reported in a urinalysis are reported as either negative, trace, or positives. So sometimes you'll see plus, sometimes you'll see plus plus, or plus plus plus, or even, what does that mean? The more pluses, the, the higher the level. Is this a very, is this a quantitative scale? What is WA? Your analysis. U slash A, urine, urine oh, analysis. Oh, that's a U slash A. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a WA. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, plus, 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 plus. Is that a quantitative scale? No. It's not qualitative. What's it called when you, when you can rank order things? You said you remembered statistics. It's called ordinal. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So it just means more. How much more? I don't know. More. So um, these are ordin it's an ordinal scale, but whatever. The more pluses, the more of it there is. So white blood cells are the first thing. Um, leukocytes are typically going to be present when there is a UTI. The second thing would be nitrites. Now, what is a nitrite? What is a nitrate, first of all? I don't remember. So nitrate is NO4. Remember that? What's nitrite? NO3. Okay, so what produces nitrites? Bacteria. 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 So in your urine, there are natural nitrates. When your urine is colonized with bacteria, what do you get? You get the production of nitrites. By the way, um, preserved meats are high in nitrites. Why? Well, in the old days, what you did is you basically encourage the right kind of bacteria to grow in them. So like pastrami and pepperoni and all those are actually fermented meats. And bacteria has turned the nitrates into nitrites. Nowadays, we just cure them by injecting nitrites into them. And if you get uncured bacon or whatever, is it actually uncured? Does it have no nitrites in it? No. It's just instead of using nitrite that was manufactured in a, in a factory, we we concentrated celery juice until it had the same amount of nitrite, and then we injected that into it. So it's just the same amount of nitrites. It's not any healthier. It's just a different source of nitrites. If you want less lower nitrites, move to Europe and get naturally fermented meats. Then you'll have lower nitrites. Um, hold on now. OK. Um, so. If, if you have leukocytes and nitrites together, that is a very good chance that the patient has a urinary tract infection. So then we also have pH, which can be either, now this one is actually gonna be a quantitative scale. So you'll actually get an actual number for the pH. Um, during urinary tract infections, there'll be changes in pH, and there can also be changes in pH based on other things going on in the body, such as diabetic ketoacidosis, or um, you know, uh, just acidosis or alkalosis in general. Then we have the presence of blood, red blood cells. And what's the name for presence of red blood cells? Hematuria. Now, when there's so much blood that you can actually see the blood in the urine, what's that called? Frank hematuria. Poor Frank. 
Then we have protein in the urine. What's that called? Protein urea. Now, the amount of protein that's detectable on a urinalysis is quite high. So in order to detect low levels of it, you would need a more sensitive test. What's that more sensitive test called? Microalbuminuria. It's also more expensive, so you don't do that on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> so, and then we have something called urobilinogen, which we are going to ignore. Ready. All right. The last time we stopped, we were mid urinalysis. So let's go back over that just ever so quickly. So U slash A, urinalysis. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the first thing we said was leukocytes or white blood cells and then nitrites. So when both of those are present, that's a pretty good indicator that the patient has a urinary tract infection. And then pH will also be modified during um, urinary tract infection. It can also be changed with um, alkalosis or acidosis and other disease processes. So it's not the only thing. Um, then we had um, red blood cells and hematuria. Then we had proteinuria. And then the, the next one is ketones, ketourea, and glucose. So if glucose is in the urine, that's usually a sign that the patient has a blood sugar level higher than 180. However, there are some drug classes that can impact that. What drug class would that be? What, what drug class inhibits those, um, sodium, those glucose transporters so that you urinate out more glucose? No, 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 we just learned them. Yeah, just learned them. Um, SGLT2 receptor inhibitors, canagliflozin, or Invokana. Oh, no, 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 stop. Let me <laughs> <laughs> SGLT2 inhibitors, mm -hmm. such as canagliflozin, mm -hmm. also known as a Makata. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are like passing it? around the wrong drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just saying, what is the, do you pee out the glucose? So, so what's the question? Wait, which I thought is SGLT2 in GLP. Yes, and Cretin is GLP1. Not SGLP. No, 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 no. Yes. Okay, so now that we have all that out of the way, um, so ketones, in, the, in uh, the older days, before keto diets became all the fad, the presence of ketones was usually a sign the patient might be going into ketoacidosis, especially if they also had high glucose in the urine. Um, nowadays, with, ketos with ketotic diets, it's very common for patients to have ketones in their blood, in their urine, but no glucose. And that's because they're on a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. So presence of ketones in and of itself is not necessarily a problem, but if it's a diabetic patient, they've got glucose and ketones, then you've got to suspect ketoacidosis. And then there's a number of other things that are not really that important for us, such as urobilinogen. Um, that doesn't really matter for our purposes. Um, and then it's a breakdown product of bilirubin, whatever. Now, something that is important is specific gravity. There's a question. Yeah, so specific gravity is a measurement of, of um, concentration. The more stuff that is constant, that is dissolved in urine, the more concentrated it will be, the higher that number. So, if that number is high, what does it mean? Yeah. Urine is more concentrated. If, the urine, if that number is low, what does it mean? Less concentrated. Less concentrated. <clears throat> so, for example, in diabetes insipidus, what would you expect? A high or a low specific gravity? High. Low. 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 What, what's, the, what's diabetes insipidus characterized by? Large amounts of very dilute urine. So it would have what kind of specific gravity? Low. A low specific gravity. All right. Do we need to know the Yeah, there is. I can't remember what the number is on your lab value sheet off. It's 1.005. Oh, see, that's different than what I memorized. 1.003. Yeah. 
1.05 to 1.03. Yeah. So when I when I memorized it for my school, it was 1.003. So that's what's in my head. But uh, reference values may change may vary by lab. So um, that's what specific gravity is. Any questions about your analysis in general? All right, at this time, what we're going to do is we are going to concentrate on urinary tract infections for just a moment. So, quick recap from Pathopharm 1. What is the difference between a complicated and an uncomplicated urinary tract infection? They have, like, something helping them. Okay, so instrumentation is one. So that would be a catheter or surgery, or well, instrumentation can be a catheter or it could be a scope or a stent. And then, um, what's the other thing? Are for complicated. For complicated, either instrumentation or surgery or immunosuppression. So if a person's had surgery in that area, if a person's had instrumentation of that area, or if they're immunosuppressed, we call that complicated. What do you do for complicated? That's for uncomplicated. So for uncomplicated, you would give um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, better known as septra. And then for um, complicated, what do you do? You want to get a culture, and then you typically would start them on empiric therapy with uh, fluoroquinolone, such as ciprofloxacin. Uh, for an uncomplicated, if your patient is allergic to sul uh, sulfa drugs, what would you give them instead, typically? Ciprofloxacin. All right, now... Urinary tract infections can be anywhere from the urethra, which we would call urethritis, up through the bladder, which would be called cystitis. In men, the number one cause of urethritis would be sexually transmitted infections. How do you spell your urethra? Urethra. U-R-E-T-H-R-A. So, urinary tract infections are more common in women than men. Why is that? Because women have shorter urethras, and where is that urethra located? Well, it's inside the labia and relatively close to the anus. The number one um, causative agent is E. coli, and so you can imagine how that happens. So, in general, things that would help would be wiping from front to back. And then um, it's also, you should avoid bubble baths, especially in little girls because they have even shorter little urethras. Um, men, not only do they have a longer urethra, but also there's just more physical space between the rectum and the penis, so much less likely to occur. Now, uh, the most common urinary tract infection is cystitis, and that is going to be just of the bladder itself. So you've got acute, cyst uh, acute cystitis, which is urinary tract infection, and then you've got chronic cystitis, which may or may not be associated with bacterial growth. If there's no bacterial growth, then the most likely cause would be interstitial cystitis, which is caused by an inflammation of the bladder cells, and you don't treat that with antibiotics. Now, once you go, so here's our bladder, there's your urethra, and then you've got these tubes that go up to what? A kidney. So there'll be one on each side. So if you have an infection of the kidney, that's going to be called pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is very similar in symptoms to a urinary tract infection. So what are the symptoms of a urinary tract infection? Burning. Okay, burning when you go to the bathroom, what's that called? Dysuria. 
How often do you have to go when you have a urinary tract infection? Frequently. More often, so that's called frequency. Um, so dysuria and frequency are probably the two most common. In elderly folks, a lot of times they will be um, confused. So you also should examine uh, patient's mental status, especially in the elderly. And then fever, white, high white blood cell count. The number one um, infection in the hospital is UTIs. And part of that is because of the large amount of instrumentation, people getting Foley catheters, you know, just a higher level of infection risk. Now, when it comes to pyelonephritis, the symptoms are pretty much the same. So how, what, what symptom would be kind of a sign that this is probably a kidney infection and not just a regular UTI? Low back pain, Low back pain so pain down here? Right, pain right here? Is, is this where it hurts? Okay, so this is referred to as flank pain. So flank pain or costovertebral angle tenderness. CVA tenderness. Which we all learned in health assessment. Um, as far as the treatment, oh, now as far as causes, it can come, if you have a bacteria that travels up we call that an ascending infection. So if the bacterial source is outside of the, the bladder and then it travels up through the bladder into the kidney, that's called an ascending infection. You can also get an infection from inside the blood. So if the patient's got bacteria in the blood, that can get deposited on the glomerulus and then from there invade the kidney. And that's called not ascending. <laughs> Pyelonephritis. So, what's the functional what's the functional unit of the kidney? The nephron. So it's nephritis. Um, and then pelvis refer pyelo refers to the pelvis of the kidney. Okay. All right. Um, treatment is basically the same as a complicated UTI. You want to treat them, you want to get a uh, culture first and then treat empirically until the culture comes back. Pyelonephritis is potentially life threatening. It can cause acute kidney failure in severe cases. All right. What's next on our little menu of things to talk about? Kidney stones. Now, I don't, is that what we're supposed to talk about next? I don't think so. Say again? Yeah, so, no, urethritis, we already talked about that. Yeah. You can also, yeah, so in men, you can also have prostatitis and epididymitis. Those are technically GU infections, but bygones. What else you got? No. Pelvic inflammatory disease, which is an infection of the uterus. P uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is almost always associated with sexually transmitted infections and is potentially life-threatening. Maybe I shouldn't say almost always. It's often associated with sexually transmitted infections and is potentially life-threatening. What else you got? All right, glomerulonephritis. Now, glomerulonephritis is an inflammation of the glomerulus and it's usually from a toxin inside the blood. So glomerulonephritis can often be associated with, um, with things like um, IV dyes or contrast or certain drugs that have the potential to, when they get filtered to be toxic to the glomerulus. Give me an example of one. From Pathopharm 1. It's an antibiotic that's only given IV. It only kills gram-negative aerobic bacteria. Aminoglycosides. Aminoglycosides. Right, <laughs> aminoglycosides. Of course I knew that. Duh. Okay. <laughs> What's an aminoglycoside? <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, 
When patients have glomerular nephritis, we want to remove the offending agent, if at all possible, and treat the underlying symptoms and uh, you know, provide support, essentially. So a lot of times we'll give anti-inflammatory drugs because that's what you do. Um, now, question? The IV dyes or contraceptive diagnosed? That's how you diagnose it? Is that no, that can, be, that can be the cause. That can be the cause, okay. Yeah. All right, so now, um, some, there's um, nephrotic syndrome, which we have to mention. So nef in nephrotic syndrome, what happens is that the nephron becomes um, permeable to protein. So what happens is you now have protein in the filtrate. We have no mechanism to resorb that protein, so what happens to it? It ends up passing down through into the urine, and that results in uh, large amounts of proteinuria. Uh, it's going to cause an, osmo an osmotic diuresis, so they'll have larger volume, uh, blood volume than usual, or sorry, larger um, urinary volume than usual, and that protein in the urine causes the urine to be frothy. So, um, nephrotic syndrome is quite common in, in children. Now, when we say common, it's like, not like 30% of children get it, but it, you're gonna see it more commonly in children than you will in adults. Um, children also sometimes don't have the best formed um, kidneys to begin with, so as, as they mature. You know, like little kids sometimes will have frothy pee and then it goes away as they get older. That's not really nephrotic syndrome, it's just they weren't quite as, as good. Quite as sealed up. Um, now, you might think that if you're losing proteins in the urine, what you want to do is eat a high-protein diet to replace that protein. But in fact, that actually makes things worse. It's like adding fuel to the fire. So instead, those patients are advised to eat a relatively low-protein diet. Then we have what is called as nephritic syndrome with an I. And these are going to be your nephritises. So nephritis can result from a number of things. Uh, one of the ones that you need to be the most familiar with is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So in this case, what does the name imply? Post-streptococcal. After, After you've got a strep infection. Now, what complication have we already learned can occur in untreated strep inf infections? Acute rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever. So, in post-streptococcal nephritis, glomerular nephritis, what happens is you have antibodies that attach to um, strep antigens. Then those antibody antigen complexes float down through the blood until they eventually end up on the glomerulus. And they stick to the glomerulus. They don't just keep going through the rest of the blood again. They stick to that surface. Now, what do we know the four purposes of an antibody? What are they? Now, you guys are avoiding eye contact. I don't know. Well, no, that's, that's resistance of antibiotics. <laughs> Antibodies. Activate? No. Activate what? Perception. So, what's the first job? Of, what's the, what, is the, what is the first job of an antibody? From last semester. Yeah. To stick to it, and that by doing that, it neutralizes. I got one. It neutralizes. Okay, so it opsonizes, so it marks it for destruction by macrophages, and then what? Say again. No, that's that's resistance to antibiotics. Wrong test. That's test two. Test three is where we are now. Activate something. Activate the T cell. No. no, it's the little, it's a little thing, right? What little thing? It's like the little <laughs> channel pour thing, so then it can go wow. inside. What's that called? The MAC. The what Mac. is the MAC? Oh. The MAC. Oh. Yeah, no. What's the MAC okay. part of? Yeah. Well, that's that's opsonize. Yeah. The complement yeah. cascade ends up in the MAC, the membrane attack complex. So, <laughs> activate complement <laughs> cascade. So. You've got this antibody antigen that is stuck. Oh, by the way, the last function of an antibody is to increase inflammation. So you've got this little antibody antigen complex that's stuck to the glomerulus. 
what's going to happen? It's going to activate the complement cascade and increase inflammation in that area, and that is the cause of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which can occur up to three to six weeks after a strep infection. So in addition to destroying your heart valves and causing acute rheumatic fever and potentially even blindness, strep infection can also cause acute kidney failure. Oops. That's why it's so important to treat strep infections. Do you want us to know the antibiotic purposes again? More than before? No. Yes. I always want you to know the four antibody purposes. <laughs> That's why your final exam is, what's the word? Cumulative. Cumulative. Yeah, I'm like... <sighs> but I thought I put pathopharm one behind me. Yeah. Anyway, um, so... Uh, that's, glomerul that's glomerulonephritis, and then the post-streptococcal kind. Um, at this point, we're going to talk about acute renal failure. So acute renal failure takes three major forms. So it's going to be called, um, so acute renal failure. We're going to have what's called pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. Now, pre-renal is associated with decreased blood flow. Where? To the kidney. To the kidney. So tell me some reasons why a patient might have reduced blood flow to the kidneys. Do you see damage with like, their adrenal glands? All right, so I, I heard shock. Well, what is shock? Well, that's a version of shock, but what is shock, generally speaking? Oh, decreased blood pressure. Decreased blood pressure to the point where you can no longer breathe. breathe. No, no, no. What's the purpose of blood pressure? Keep the blood volume. So low blood volume. Well, that is a cause of shock. Yeah. So let's just focus on the blood pressure. It's a reduction in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Increase. What is the purpose of blood pressure? <coughs> to push blood through the heart or through the body. That's called perfusion. Mm -hmm. So shock is when blood pressure goes so low that no. perfusion is compromised. Mm -hmm. So shock can re shock can result in decreased blood flow to the kidneys because it's decreased blood flow well everywhere eventually. Now, what's the treatment for shock? Well, it depends on the kind. All right, so if it's hypovolemic, then what's the treatment? Fluids. Fluids. All right, that seems, sounds fair. Would that cause decreased blood flow, giving fluids? No. What if it's cardiogenic shock? Mm -hmm. Wait, what's the question? <laughs> what, what, what is cardiogenic shock? Come on, people. What, what does cardio mean? Right. You'd think you were the ones that didn't have lunch. <laughs> I'm just hangry at you guys. <laughs> so, cardiogenic, what is cardio? What is genic? Causing. So, the, the heart is causing the, heart, the shock, so because the heart isn't doing its job well enough. What's the treatment for that? Drugs that not epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Now, both of those drugs are what category of drug? Catecholamines, Catecholamines and they activate what two receptors in particular? Beta one and alpha one. Now, in beta one, that makes the heart pump harder and stronger. What does alpha one do? Causes vasoconstriction, including vasoconstriction of the what? 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 the renal arteries, which can reduce blood flow to the kidneys, causing kidney failure. And in fact, last class, we talked about a drug that can be used to prevent renal failure during that treatment. Mm -hmm. What drug was it? It's a... <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't even have the excuse that it was Pato Farm. Manitol. Manatees. <laughs> so manitol can be used to help prevent that. Um, now, what if it's neurogenic shock? What is neurogenic shock? You lose the sympathetic tone, which allows the arteries to open up. What is the treatment for that? Vacos, vasoconstrictors, things that activate alpha one, which has the potential to cause decreased renal blood flow. So anything that decreases renal blood flow is going to result potentially in pre-renal failure. So shock, the treatment for shock with alpha one stimulants, but then we also have heart failure in general. So shock, catecholamines, heart failure, and renal artery stenosis, RAS. What is renal artery, what, is, what does the word stenosis mean? Narrowing or closing. So what is renal artery stenosis? When the renal artery is closed off or narrowed. Now, what's the cause of that narrowing, usually? It's an atherosclerosis buildup. So if you get atherosclerosis buildup in the renal artery, that can result in pre-renal failure. Now, so what's the defining characteristic of pre-renal failure? Decreased blood flow to what? To the kidneys. The next one is intrarenal. This is a problem inside the kidney itself. So glomerulonephritis is you know, one of the major causes there. So poisons, infections, something is actually causing a problem inside the kidney. Acute tubular necrosis. When we say acute tubular necrosis, what do we mean? What, is, what tubular are we talking about? The what? <laughs> the kidney tubes. Okay, what tubes would those be? The convoluted tubules, distal and proximal, and maybe even the Lupa Henle too. What is that called? What's what? Acute tubular necrosis. So when you when we talk about drugs that are toxic to the kidneys, that's the sort of thing that it causes. All right. So inside the kidney is intrarenal. Now, what is after the kidney? In the body, what is after the kidneys? So blood flow fed the kidney. Then we had the kidney itself, intrarenal. What's after the kidney? Before you get to the bladder. Or what's, what's in the bladder? Urine. So, what, what is well, the kidneys produce urine, right? So after the kidneys is urine. So what's supposed to happen to the urine? I erased it, but I, it goes what? Out. Out. Out what? Out the ureter, down to the bladder, into the urethra, and out of the body. Now, what happens if you block the passage? Oh, it can't go out. So what happens? It builds up where? So let's say you've got a blockage right here. What happens to the urine? It builds up in the kidney and the kidney will actually get larger. It will blow up like a balloon. And that is called hydronephrosis. The water, the nephro is full of hydro. If that goes on long enough, it can result in post renal failure. So, in very severe cases of urinary retention, you can end up with post renal failure. Post -renal failure. If you've got a kidney stone blocking the ureter, what can that potentially end up with? Post renal, post -renal acute failure. Okay, so the key behind these renal failures is that they're what kind of renal failure? Acute. 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 They happen quickly. But because they happen quickly, they can also be transient if you can fix the underlying problem. Does that make sense? Transient means it wasn't for a very long time. You fix, if you fix 
you know, if it's post renal failure from a blockage and you unblock it, you fix the problem, patient goes out of failure. Now, how would we know that a patient's in renal failure? Are there any lab values you might want to monitor? Yeah. BUN. BUN and yeah. creatinine. When those are both high together, we call it? No. Say it again? Acetemia. Acetemia. Yeah. And if the patient has symptoms of renal failure, then we call it? Oh, I see. Uremia. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll talk about chronic renal failure a little bit later. What comes next? in your little notes there. Is it just chronic? Yeah. Oh, I told you to be fast. All right, so before we talk about it, let's talk about um, kidney stones for a few minutes. Um, kidney stones are nasty little buggers. So kidney stones are formed in the kidney, usually in the renal pelvics, pelvis, and as long as they're hanging out in the renal pelvis, they don't really cause problems. But once one of them decides that it's going to go down into a ureter, it starts to cause problems. Because as it pushes against the ureteral walls and damages them a little bit, your body does not know how to handle that. And that will result in what's called ureteral colic. Colic. Hurts incredibly bad. Yeah, you did learn about biliary colic, but that is not related, except for the word colic. So, um, patients will typically have flank pain, and it's an unimaginably, unimaginably bad pain. It's actually worse than childbirth. Now, saying that in a room full of women always gets these like stares like, you would know you're not a woman. <laughs> We know that childbirth is the worst pain ever. You men are so stupid. Okay, well, oh, okay, that's fine. Granted, I have never been pregnant. I've never given birth <laughs> to a child. <laughs> but I have had plenty of patients who were female and have given birth to children. And you know what they said? It's, worse. it's way worse than childbirth. See, here's the thing. Your body is actually designed to push a little baby out of that. It is not designed to push that out. So our bodies don't really know how to handle that. What, what's that kind of pain that, that it's internal organ pain? What's that word for that? Visceral. visceral pain. It's a visceral pain that our bodies are not really designed to handle. So extreme pain, and then that's usually also associated with a sympathetic response. So patients will be um, nauseated. A lot of times they'll actually vomit. And they'll have cold sweats and they'll be pale or ashen. Sweating. Sweating. Yep, diaphoresis. Cold and clammy. So as this goes down, the pain can intensify, and then eventually it'll come into the bladder. And then at that point, you gotta shoot it out the urethra. But guess what? That's actually the easy part. Because how many of you, you go to the bathroom, you just go by relaxing, and it just happens, right? But you could also push it and make it happen, right? So there's a lot of pressure in here, and pew, down there, it's like fast gone. But there's nothing, there's no pressure behind here except whatever the kidney's putting out. How can you increase the amount of pressure from what the kidney's putting out? You can drink more. That's all you got. You, you drink more. But what's one of the symptoms? Nausea and vomiting. So it's one of those things where you need to drink enough water so that you can increase your urine production to push that thing out, but at the same time, you don't want to get so much that you increase vomiting. So, when it comes to management of kidney stones, the number one most important thing is pain control. And if necessary, nausea control. 
then we want to try and resolve the stone. So one, the most common way to do that is with conservative therapy, which means increase fluids and hope they pee it out. It does work fairly well, but it, you know, there's some issues with it. If you're drinking four liters of water, what can that result in? Four, four or five liters of water a day, what can that result in? Electrolyte imbalances. So you know, the patient needs to make sure they're also eating enough electrolytes. Um, and it's also just hard to drink that much water. One of the interesting things that I've discovered, because I've actually had kidney stones before, is that if you drink, um, if you drink four ounces, which is about half a cup, if you drink four ounces of water every five minutes for two hours, you will stay up all night going to the bathroom. You go to the bathroom like every hour on the hour um, for the whole night. Hopefully it goes away. Well, you can drink you can drink pretty much whatever, but you don't want to drink certain things. So there's three different types of stones. Uh, the most common stones are oxalate stones. They're calcium oxalate. And if you drink drinks that are high in oxalate, that can actually help the stones to get bigger. So if you don't want to drink high oxalate drinks such as cola sodas. Beer, on the other hand, is perfectly acceptable. Uh -huh. Also enhances the effect of the opioid. Oh, wait, wait, don't do that. So, um, increased fluids, that's conservative therapy. And then if conservative therapy isn't enough, there's a number, oh, you can also give um, alpha-1 blockers. Name an alpha-1 blocker. You got nothing, huh? All of those drug, thank you. Tamsulosin or Flomax. So what that will do is it will relax the ureter so it doesn't colic up as much, and that will reduce pain, and it will also help the drug or the stone to pass more easily. <clears throat> so that would be your conservative therapy, alpha-1 blockers and increase uh, fluids. Another thing you can do is they can put a stent up. So they put a little scope up here, find where the stone is, and they put a little, a little wire cage in here, a little wire mesh that holds this open and allows the stone to come out more easily. Those are temporary. Um, they have like this little string attached and eventually you go back to the doctor and they pull on the little string and it collapses the cage and it comes back out. Yeah, I know. It sounds horrific. Stent. S-T-E-N-T. -E like a tent with an S at the beginning. All right. Then um, you could also do what's called lithotripsy. Lith means stone. Um, and in lithotripsy, what we're going to do is give them super high power ultrasound. And the, basically, the ultrasonic waves vibrate the little, the little uh, kidney stone into pieces. Now, the, dis the advantage there is you no longer have a large stone blocking, but now you have a little, a little cloud of stones that have to be passed, each one. So you still have to pass them, but it might be easier because it's smaller. But now you've got to pass more of them. Lots of times when patients get kidney stones, there will be several stones up in here, and only one is traveling down. But what that means is the patient may have to pass several stones in order to clear everything. I know, right? Um, and then another thing that can be done is if you give the patient an intravenous pilogram, IVP, it's, um, it's a... IV contrast dye that is used to, um, when you take an x-ray of the kidney, you don't really see that much because it's kind of not radio opaque. By filling it up with this dye, it makes it easier so you can see what's inside the kidney. So that 
dye is kind of thick and actually helps to push the stones out. That is not the purpose of an IVP, but I've had a couple patients who tell me that it's the best thing for them to get rid of their stones. Now, the most important thing of all, when you're dealing with stones in you or a friend or loved one, is that to you, it will be a medical emergency. But you're in no chance of dying in the next couple hours or even day. So when you go to the emergency room, guess what? You're going to wait. So the most important thing to remember is don't go to the emergency room for your urinary, for your kidney stone. Instead, go to either an urgent care or a urologist's office. Another thing that can also help is uh, Toradol. NSAIDs can cause a little bit of um, ureteral um, dilation, and they also help to reduce pain. So a lot of times the way you treat a patient is you give them um, some oxycodone, or in severe cases, even Dilaudid. Give them some, uh, give them some uh, Phenergan, anti-nausea medication, give them some Tamsulosin for the colic, and then also a shot of Toradol. Any questions about kidney stones? All right, last item on our list is chronic kidney disease. So chronic kidney disease ultimately leads to chronic renal failure. The main drivers of chronic kidney disease are high blood pressure and diabetes mellitus. If left untreated, or even at relatively low amounts, so let's say your blood pressure is just slightly high, over time it's going to contribute to kidney damage and increase the likelihood of kidney failure. If you got them both together, it can be exponentially faster. The way that we measure your kidney function is by glomerular filtration rate, GFR, which can be estimated with your creatinine clearance. Well, for everyone. So if you look up GFR estimated, you can, you'll see the formula. You don't need to know the formula. You just need to know that it can be done. So um, GFR is the primary way that we can tell. You can also just look at creatinine levels in younger patients or um, creatinine clearance in older patients. The first sign that there's a problem is not going to be creatinine going up. The first sign there's a problem is going to be the presence of protein in the urine. Because what is the body's response to injury? Inflammation. Inflammation, which causes Protein. membrane permeability increase. So if you've got inflammation in the kidney, you're more likely to have protein in the urine over time. When it comes to treating it, the main thing is to prevent it. Um, as a patient gets worse and worse, there becomes less and less you can do. Um, you can use loop diuretics to increase urine uh, output in the early stages, and eventually the patient will get to what's called end-stage renal disease, where they only have about 10% of their renal function left. So once they go from normal down to 25% of their normal GFR, we call that renal failure at that point. When they get down to 10%, we call it end-stage renal disease. What's the treatment for end-stage renal disease? Well, before we do that, dialysis. dialysis. There's two major forms of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis has the advantage that it's quicker, and peritoneal dialysis has the advantage that it's not as invasive, but it takes longer. So in either way, you're essentially um, hooking them up to a machine that's going to function as a kidney for them. In hemodialysis, they typically do it three days a week. So it's usually like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, th uh, Tuesday Thursday, Saturday schedule. 
because most of the centers are off on Sunday. What about the peritoneal? is every day. Patients with uh, chronic renal failure will also typically have lower red blood cell counts. Tell me why. Because the kidneys are in charge of producing erythropoietin, and in renal failure, they don't produce as much. So in hemodialysis, we'll typically give them a small amount of erythropoietin to help maintain blood, uh, red blood cell flow or production. In the end stages, as the patient has higher and higher levels of uremia that can't be excreted in the urine, eventually what will happen is they're going to end up with uh, the uremia coming out of their skin. So their they'll, skin will turn yellow and it'll actually begin to ooze out of their skin as crystals. And that is called uremic frost and causes, it can cause pruritus and itching. And then the ultimate cure for end stage renal disease is a kidney transplant. Does someone have to die that you can get your kidney transplant? No. Not necessarily, because everyone's got two kidneys. Well, not everyone, but most people have two kidneys. So you can have a live donor uh, kidney. When you get your kidney, they don't take the old ones out. They just put the new one in on top of the other two. So now you got three kidneys, just two don't work. What? Pretty cool, huh? I didn't know that. Why wouldn't you keep the other two out? I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not I'm telling you how it works, but yeah. Um, there's actually a NBA player who's got, who's had a kidney transplant. Can you think of who it is? Alonzo Mourning. He's before your time, huh? Mm -hmm. And everyone, say again? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't follow much sports. Yeah, sorry. No, she's a singer. Oh, I'm sorry. Could, wait, did you say Selena Gomez? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what you're saying. I thought you were saying a. So, don't know what you're saying. Yeah. So Selena. Yeah. <laughs> you know who else um, had kidney kidney failure problems? Gary Coleman. Do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. He was in Different Strokes. He's a little little guy. Never got taller than this. And then he was on some uh, reality TV shows. Yep. And, uh, what would mean? I think it would be yep. All right. Any questions about kidney failure? On that note, we're going to be done with renal. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Can uh -huh. you go over um, just before we move on? Like, Reading you want an ABG question? Sure. Yeah, I know. You guys are always going to have an ABG question. Um, how about if I just refer you to the uh, to the video from Papa Farm One? All right. Oh, okay. Tell you what. Um, Ines is going to give you two ABG problems. You're going to solve them. And then we'll grade them when I come back. Oh, jeez. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs>